Hi, my name is Tyree Marshall and I am an Artistic Associate Producer at East West Players and I want to welcome you to our virtual panel for the Great Jerry Curl Debate by Inda Craig Alvan. I am so thrilled to have this conversation with amazing AAPI and Black community artivists, I will call them, to speak about building a bridge between our two communities and strengthening our relationships so we can both collectively heal, but also fight against white supremacy within the systems of our country. So I am so thrilled that you are here and I wanna remind you that the Great Jerry Curl Debate is closing this weekend. So if you haven't already, please visit our website and grab a ticket. I really want you to see this important work by Inda Craig Alvan and at East West Players. All right, now on to the programming. Welcome to this panel for the Great Jerry Curl Debate. And it's called uh, Building a Bridge, which is bringing amazing AAPI identifying and black identifying folks, artists, uh, people to talk about bridging uh, a gap or coming together to help each other heal within our communities and uh, help each other fight against white supremacy. <laughs> so I have some beautiful folks here that are going to speak and uh, I cannot wait for y'all to meet them. But first I want to do some introductions, but personally I want everyone on this panel to introduce themselves because I feel like even if I did do a spiel, I wouldn't give y'all um, justice because y'all have lists of things I can go on. <laughs> but I want everyone to hear what you have to say about yourself and I want you to put out what you want folks to hear. So I will popcorn it to Tiana. Hi, I'm Tiana Randall Quant. Um, pronoun she, her, hers. Uh, sorry, I forgot to put that in my name description. Um, but yeah, I am an an actor, um, collaborative storyteller. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Blacklist, which is a, a sort of green book accountability mechanism for LA theater. Um, I'm also one of the authors of the Los Angeles Anti-Racist Theater Standards. Um, and yeah, and I'm really excited to be here. If you want to popcorn it to somebody else. <laughs> um, I will popcorn it to Chris. Hello, um, my name is Chris Anthony and I'm an educator, a director, a theater maker. I was in Los Angeles for a very long time making Shakespeare adaptations with teenagers at the Shakespeare Center for their summer job. Um, and so a lot of my work has been at that intersection of conversation and art making and community, sort of how all those things fit together. And I'm very excited to be part of this panel. And I will popcorn it to, is it Celia or Celia? It's Celia, thank you for asking. <laughs> yes, um, I'm Celia Mandela Rivera, she, her, her pronouns, um, Black Latinx theater maker, administrator, um, the literary manager at I Am A Theater Company. I am also co-founder and creator of Blacklist and co-author of LA Anti-Racist Theater Standards. And um, just super excited to be here. Jade. Hello, my name is Jade Kigalowen. I am the Arts Education Director for East West Players. Um, I am also currently a grad student over at Cal State LA, getting my master's in education over there, emphasis in curriculum and instruction. It's been really fruitful uh, being there. I am also an educator. I teach at Cal Poly Pomona for the theater department. And I also oversee the uh, student hiring for the music department there as well. Um, and <laughs> I'm an organizer with Gabriela South Bay, which is a Filipino women's organization. And we work on, um, well, different social issues, not just uh, what's going on in the Philippines, but here as well, and how uh, US imperialism affects everybody. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gonna popcorn it over to Lee. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lee Painter Kim. My pronouns are they, them. I'm a queer, non-binary mask and biracial Korean and white American writer and organizer. Um, I'm the Los Angeles chapter lead for Blazion March, which is headquartered in New York and founded by Rohan Julie, um, an active core member of the Asian arts grassroots organization Stop Discrimination and a community, a community member of the Korean American nonprofit Yopo. 
Um, recently, I've published with uh, Rutledge, GeoPress, and a few uh, other um, publishers on issues related to Asian and mixed race identity and systems of power within the fine arts industry. Um, my organizing centers queer and trauma-informed approaches to interconnected struggles and social and cultural transformation. <laughs> So like I said, the list goes on. Uh, we have some amazing folks. Um, so I think one of the first things I wanted to chat about is maybe the last few years. I know it's a downer. <laughs> COVID is a thing. Um, but if any, if anybody wants to share how maybe these last few years have affected you, and then maybe we can touch base about how it's affected our cultures, because I know some events happen that heighten a few things for all of us. I will jump in and say, of course, I forgot to say in my introduction, the thing that I'm actually doing now, which is that I'm an acting teacher at DePaul University. So I have gone from community to conservatory, which is really interesting. And I've gone from California to Chicago, which is also interesting in a very different way. Um, but I, I, one of the things that I will say is that um, I have, I've, I've said this to my students earlier, um, today is that I am, you know, I'm a black woman from the Midwest. Um, I'm of a certain age at this point. So my parents grew up in segregation. My, my people are from the South. I'm a, I'm a first generation Midwesterner. I'm the fifth generation freeborn. Um, all of these things are very, um, present and alive for me. And I take that with me into the classroom because I feel like my whole education was about surviving a system. And 2016 told me that I could no longer, actually the George Zimmerman trial told me that I could no longer be content to teach students how to survive a system my job as a teacher is to empower people to change systems. And that is a really big turn for me. And I've been working on it. I've been working on it. It's not just right now today. It's not just 2020. Uh, and I will say, I see students receptive to that message. And so one of the things that happened in the pandemic, you know, we moved to online classes and it's like, that was a that was a trauma right that was a trauma but it allowed a lot of people to see the same thing at the same time i was literally in class on january 6th you know and my students were saying chris can we watch this what is going on right like we all watched it together which is really difficult i think in the era of streaming and we don't watch walter cronkite at six o'clock or whatever um but i feel like one of the things that i have learned is that my students are ready and hungry for the tools to make change and um, being young some of them have come from backgrounds where their families have made sure that they were never uncomfortable one day in their lives and so they're meeting people who have always been uncomfortable every day of their lives and so just trying to figure out what that means for us as artists what does it mean for those of us who seek the truth to speak the truth? So um, I've, I've seen a lot of willingness and that's one thing that I'm actually really excited about since 2020. Um, is it okay if I sort of piggyback on that? Oh yeah, yeah, we'll just drop in whenever. Um, there were a lot of things that really struck me in what you just said, Chris, um, and that were that were definitely like relatable and definitely like sort of like opened up sort of memories from just the past two years that I'd sort of like blocked out, like January 6th, um, <laughs> just blocked that out. Um, something else that you said, though, was um, talking about being first generation Midwesterner and fifth generation freeborn because it's so one that's such a low number but it's so it's probably very very common 
among, you know, people of the African diaspora, of Black people, you know, and stuff like that. And so, like, I'm thinking about, like, so I started, like, kind of doing math a little bit after you said that, like, okay, like, uh, two, three, four, like, yeah, like, and, and for me, it's probably only, like, four or five also. And so I was just really st struck by that. Um, but also talking about the pandemic and talking about how it, it really turned everything on its head and, and how um, the, the shutdown turned everything on its head. Um, there was a lot, it, it was a lot of trauma and it was a lot of like, sort of like a, a kind of isolation that, that even Zoom couldn't even uh, fix. But I also feel like I, I, I'm very grateful for the ways in which more people I feel like realized like, oh, the way we were doing things really was not working um, because it sort of like made everybody sort of stop. And in theater, I feel like, you know, Zoom theater forced so many of us to get like really creative and, and you know, for low income multi-hyphenate artists, like we're always having to be like, more creative in order to like bring about a piece of work or something like that um but like zoom really on sort of like an institutional work culture level sort of changed things i feel like changed our our work culture that we had in la theater and it was really i feel like encouraging to see people go oh no more we're really not doing this anymore we're really not doing this anymore um and and so yeah so i've been really grateful to see that progress and i've been really grateful to see the pushback and the resistance that there has been in the face of so many institutions trying to go back to normal and, and pretend as if the pandemic is not still going on or pretend as if things haven't changed and stuff like that and oftentimes going back on the promises that they made you know Oh, you know, over the beginning of lockdown, especially like the summer of 2020 and stuff like that, there was a lot of promises made about like racial equity and, and actually addressing and dismantling white supremacy and actually dismantling all these things that had been hurting artists for generations, you know, and then after the holidays, suddenly it was just like, oh, did we say that? And it was just like, yeah, you did. And if you're not willing to do it, we actually like it, it was the the community realizing that they had the power to take it into their own hands as opposed to begging these institutions that had never been interested in doing it um and so that's been really i feel like fruitful and encouraging to see and i'm really grateful for that well thank you tiana for those beautiful words. Yeah, it's definitely been such a trying time for all of us. I mean, it's technically still happening. Um, <laughs> I mean, it feels like it, it's kind of dwindling down, but I, I'm hesitant to say that it's over. Um, but do you feel like things have been more heightened during that time? Or do you feel like social media has definitely been a big presence in revealing certain things or revealing certain things to a group of people that may have not realized that that's, this is what has been going on when it comes to race in this country? Because I feel like there was a lot of realizations that happened these past two years because we were in lockdown. Um, but <laughs> it's, it's things that we've always had to deal with that have been brought to light more. Um, so does anybody have anything to say about that? Do they feel like they've noticed that presence change? In, oh, go ahead, Lee. Oh, no, no, please. I'll wait. It's okay. No, 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 please, please. <laughs> Are you sure? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, st I'm so grateful for this conversation, too. Um, you know, for instance, with how the Asian American community has been impacted and targeted by uh, 45, um, you know, the, there's a reality even among among my communities that like, you know, Asian American, anti-Asian violence in America has been around actually for a long time. And it hasn't been until the pandemic when, you know, when Asians became the scapegoat for the, the virus, um, that it became kind of common knowledge that it kind of construct deconstructed the model minority myth. 
that you know Asians have like white adjacency and as somebody who's you know mixed like biracial Asian and white you know white adjacency is something that I think about every I've been forced to think about every day of my life and understanding how whiteness shows up in different ways and how can you transform and break down that logic um I really loved Tiana, the point that you brought up that 2020, there were a lot of promises to dismantle white supremacy and people are still kind of holding on to that cultural capital of like saying, you know, in saying that at the right moment, instead of backing it up with like systems of change, instead of, as uh, Chris pointed out, I love that you brought up how your students and the younger generation has been activated and they're hungry to enact transformative change. I, I think this is absolutely true. So many people, even across generations, I think were activated in 2020 in terms of trying to be responsible and accountable to what they can do to enacting trans, uh, social transformation away from structures built by white supremacy. But Celia, <laughs> I feel like I could say so much more, but I wanna pass the mic. <laughs> No, I, I'm also just like in awe of what everybody has to say and their own expertise and experience. And so I'm, I'm here to also just listen. Um, uh, one thing that came up in your question, Ty, um, you know, like what had been revealed during the pandemic. Um, I mean, obviously for me, it was like revealed, not revealed, but like a lot of white people still didn't get it <laughs> or like they just weren't up to speed on what was happening in the lives of marginalized folks um but i like also want to like not center them <laughs> right now and um another thing that came up you know you were talking about um Lee, you were talking about how, how folks were attacking the API community and stop Asian hate and what came up as like a black person and, and, and what we're also here to discuss is just our communities and, um, and, and both the, the, the lack of communication between the two and then also the shared history of communicating between the two and just honoring both and remembering both and, and just it was a time for me to as well reflect on that, reflect on my own feelings and reflect on, um, on what it looks like to show up for one another and how like the fight is against white supremacy and it's about like coming together as a unit so that we're stronger, um, stronger in numbers and, um, and using each other as support. Um, to help dismantle the systems that cause us pain and violence. So that's what came up for me. Wow. Um, yes, all such amazing points. And I think that's such a great segue to talk about what we came here to talk about. And we, you mentioned um, Asians and, and white adjacency. And I wanted to I wanted to talk about why people feel that way or why some folks might think that that might be the case, like historically, because I know that that might be a stereotype that other POCs might think about sometimes. So I would love to chat about that. Thank you so much for opening that up. And I, uh, Celia, like also, I'm sorry, name check. I, I, I feel like I'm mispronouncing your name and I wanted to be accountable for that. I'm sorry. This, this right time. Think, think celery. Cella, Celia. Okay. Thank you so much for holding space for that. <laughs> I'm very embarrassed. Uh, I'm like, I should pay attention more, uh, but I'm trying my best. Um, okay. So Celia, um, I really love that you brought up the nuance of like not centering whiteness. And I think you know, yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. In terms of white adjacency with uh, the model minority myth and unraveling it away from white adjacency, uh, well, that I think the model minority myth has a lot to do with social constructions that divide us. We, and if we wanna talk about, you know, the neoliberal capitalist hellscape that we live in, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's 
it's the it's the sites that divide us where we should be finding interconnected struggle i feel and where it's also where we can connect with other people um at these intersections um i also have like 20 things running through my head because that's such like a complicated social structure that's been invested in by white supremacy for the longest time and it has a lot to do honestly if you want to go global with it you know it has a lot to do with u.s imperial interest you know, look at Jap Japan at a certain point, the US and Japan, and I, you know, I, I'm thinking YK Hong for uh, circulating this on social media. Um, at a certain point, the US was supporting Japan's imperialist endeavors to colonize other nations like Korea, for instance. And Korea has been dealing with developing its soft power and influence on a global scale while having to depend on US militarization in order because they are located in a place that is like a site related to the Cold War um, or to maintaining uh, that was so cringe for me to like relate it to the Cold War. <laughs> I redact that. <laughs> we all make mistakes. Um, <laughs> but also the if anybody draft else of your thought. I'm sorry. There's a first draft of your thought. Now we'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, it's a life of drafts, right? So instead, and I think that kind of like leads to a solution of just like finding this when we do find areas of like separation where people want to blame each other for white adjacent thinking instead of looking to the root of the problem. Um, I think, you know, we, we're not perfect. You know, nobody should have any expectation of any person to be perfect or any system to be perfect, any society to be perfect, but instead understand that we're all working through the same problems to transform. Um, I don't know, also Jade, I, I wanted to know what you think too. I feel like I I cannot alone represent <laughs> community. <laughs> no, I was, I was about to jump in, thank you. Um, yeah, so. The model minority myth, or I like to say the model minority stigma because of what it's created over the years. I mean, it, it began, um, from my understanding, um, it was definitely pushed more due to the war on drugs during the Reagan era. And it was used to separate and to actually pit um, like the API and black and brown communities against each other. And they were, it, it, it's horrible because it's like you see in with my experience and from what I've seen culturally, how it's impacted me, like, and from talking to other Asian Americans and their families, like what is horrible about it is that it, it, it was hard to, not necessarily hard to have these conversations about why like the protests are happening in 2020 and why we need to care about black and brown lives. And so it unfortunately created this like, thought in our elders' heads of, oh, well, you know, we would look at us like we're doing so great, you know, but it's like, no, it's because of this stigma, it's because of what, what supremacy has done, what imperialism has done in order to keep us apart from each other. Because, I mean, like, they know there's power in numbers, and they know that when we get together, we can overthrow, basically, right? um so <laughs> uh yeah it's it's something that i always bring up um in our theater for youth programming as well with the shows that we produce and i always try to to make sure that like the model minority myth is talked about in there because it's something that needs to be undone that's something that that just it, it needs to be put away locked away go away <laughs> you know um I love model minority stigma reframe. That's like, that's amazing. But also thank you for bringing that history. So, um, of course, uh, white supremacy has to get in the middle of everything. Um, <laughs> dang that white supremacy. Um, but I wanted to talk about, do you feel like within these past few years, because of the collective struggle that we've all had, um, do you think that it's brought us closer? Or do you feel like we still have a lot of work to do in order to bridge the gap between our two cultures and 
get rid of that model minority stigma. And um, I would say like the, the system that white supremacy has put on us to separate us. Um, unless somebody else was gonna jump in. But um, I, I think that the past few years and like the, the sort of like, the collective and and I wanted to something that you said earlier Celia about how like when white people came to the conversation about race you know when when the pandemic forced them to um how so much of that so so much of that language and so much of the discourse that they were bringing to the table was so outdated or was you know set up to protect them and stuff like that like it wasn't actually based in reality um and i feel like because of you know the the stigma of the model minority and the ways in which you know the united states actively you know pits you know marginalized people against each other and creates a sort of like culture and mindset of scarcity of of rights and equality and resources and stuff like that um i i feel like that they were coming to the they were coming to the table with the same discourse that like reflected the things the the sort of like cultural mythologies that that created that tension and because we could recognize it as outdated it was easier to to get on the same page i feel like about what white supremacy was especially because we were seeing it played out in front of us at these tables and these meetings and stuff like that and also i feel directly related to the pandemic you know so much so much of of these institutions in the united states are are built off of you know or influenced by values of supremacy and empire building and and you know of violence at the core of it violence and because those institutions didn't hold up in the face of the virus and in the face of how it you know it it actually helped helped make the virus more dangerous and more deadly and stuff like that you know the fact that like we had to beg from you know the the government didn't send out tests until so late you know ev everything everything we don't have to get into like the specific trauma and history of it but like because we watched we we watched the the this sort of like cultural institution of the united states that we had been sort of that we've been sort of indoctrinated into having faith in for no reason um because more people like what what um i think what you said chris we all got to see the same thing at the same time basically um i feel like that it it's it sort of like brushed away that sort of the everything that had been in the way especially between like the aapi community and the black community because you know they're at one point like especially before like the war on drugs or you know the war on black people and poverty basically before that i feel like there had been a a, a connection but do, there had been connections between the aapi communities and the black communities especially like during the civil rights era and stuff like that we were seeing a lot of the same kind of connection building that that we're we're getting to build on that now today um so yeah so i feel like definitely in the past few years everything that's happened has sort of it's brought everybody sort of to the same reality because at this point it's like you're either living in reality or you're actively living in delusion um and so that's the that separation i feel like has really helped bridge bridge that those two things anyone else would like to add I, I would I, I I guess I have my students on my brain because I just I'm only 10 minutes out of class or something but I I, I am really um, struck by this idea of allyship just in general just in general people saying things like I need to you know uplift her voice or uh, uplift their voice or you know this idea that I don't have to be in a, a particular experience in order to empathize with that experience and in order to fight for justice for the people 
facing that injustice. And so I think there's a, a very wide net that's being cast um, where people, it's suddenly not just, ooh, that thing happened to you, but it's like, we had this experience, we had this shared experience. <laughs> um, and so I think that is one of the things that I see um, bringing communities together. One of the interesting things is that happened in the pandemic, I think, is that people had enough energy to do one thing. Like there was a point where I can't do all the things, I can just do one thing. And so people found affinity groups that were not necessarily um, based on their cultural identity. And then from there, they're finding, wait, there's all kinds of folks who also love this video game or all kinds of folks who also go to this church or whatever the thing is that was their thing. And that is an interesting way for people like we're all tending the same farm or whatever the thing is we're doing today, um, uh, feeding the same animals in a virtual, virtual world. Um, but I find that that has been sort of an interesting way for people to find connection that became the entrance to coalition across community. It was because I had this relationship online with this other person or we had this thing in common that we both did over the pandemic that, um, that is sort of building these really interesting organic relationships. Well, I think we were uh, starting to get into it a little bit of just next steps and how we come together more and really build on that allyship. Um, and I know we have a lot of um, artists on this panel. We have a lot of activists on this panel. So I don't know if anybody maybe wants to talk about what do you think can be done within these systems to kind of build that bridge more and make it stronger? And the first thing that comes to mind right now, I mean, marketing for y'all, but like seeing your show, right? It is, it's a, a piece written um, by a black woman talking about the experiences of both black and an Asian man and like showing up literally just showing up and being like, this is a story we're interested in. This is a story we want to see. This is a dialogue that we don't get to have, these conversations. And I think that's beautiful, like in a, in a, a, a smaller sense, right? Like, yes, act, act, being activists and all of that jazz, I'm here for it. But like also in my community, it means like just showing up so that you know, the, the, the people making the decisions know that these are stories, dialogues, people, relationships that we, we are interested in, that we root for, that we, we love, that we want to talk about. Um, so to start there for me. You on mute, girl. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> Zoom let me know, too late. Um, but something else, yeah, I wanted to, to jump on the back of that and also say like the great Jerry Curl debate, I would feel like is a piece of art that, that encompasses the spirit of this conversation. Um, even though it's a play that, you know, it, it takes place in a, a pastime and stuff like that, but like revisiting that and revisiting the, the sort of initial buildings of, you know, of the relationship between the Black and Korean community and stuff like that, and the complexities of that, and of that experience on both sides is, you know, um, I, I, I feel like, well, one, in this play, it's done so well, I feel. It's so um, authentic and succinct and stuff like that. And I, I just, being able to watch these two people on stage um, these sort of, not, they're not elders, but, you know, like working adults, you know, each in their respective community, sort of vibing together on stage um, is so refreshing, but I feel like so it really, it, it adds life to that, that spark of the conversation that we're trying to have, I feel. Okay, well, y'all are just here doing my job. But like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
but also shout out to Inda Craig Galvan, uh, the beautiful playwright who wrote this piece here at East West Players um, and is the reason why we're having this conversation today. I wanted to ask Jade, because you're in the education system, you have your own school, you do education here at East West Players. Just, did you have any ideas on thinking about like how to uh, strengthen that allyship within your students even that might have cultural different backgrounds, maybe Black and AAPI? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there, there's a variety of things. I mean, from an educational standpoint for me, you know, I teach introduction to theater to non-majors and a lot of what I do is that with the history aspect of it and just honestly anything in, in the class, I try to highlight, you know, um, BIPOC artists, designers, um, even it, with the shows themselves, because a lot of the time when you are taking an introduction to theater class, you're always told to read like Death of a Salesman or to read Shakespeare. And I, I uh, go in another direction and like I, I try to show them like, you know, sure, if we want to show Shakespeare, what are we going to show? You know, um, there's a really great production of, um, I think it was Comedy of Errors that's on PBS. That's really great. Um, that is, you know, it, it's an all black cast. It was a really great production. I think it was done at Public Theater in New York. Um, I could be wrong. I'm gonna have to correct myself later. <laughs> um, you know, I try to highlight, uh, you know, the importance of, you know, why I try to bridge like the world history chapter and it shouldn't be a separate chapter and bring that more so into the let's look at it from a design standpoint because people always try to silo that section and I think that it needs to be looked at for what it is. It's still theater at the end. Um, and so I try to decenter, I guess, decentering the white narrative that a lot of these books have and looking at it uh, more uh, from all across the board. Um, and then also, you know, in, in the classroom, it can be as simple as like, you know, highlighting uh, a historical figure. Um, and for me, I oversee theater for youth. We produce a show every year for youth that is toured to different schools throughout the LA Unified School District. And so this year we are doing a show called When Yuri Met Malcolm, and it's about Yuri Kochiyama and her friendship with Malcolm X. Uh, and a lot of people have really, it's just really uh, connected with them. Uh, a really huge thing is just because a lot of people knew who Yuri was. They didn't know about how deep the friendship was with Malcolm X. And I think that's really important to talk about because there are a lot of people who either don't know who she is or they didn't know about their connection, whatever it may be. And I think that's really important to talk about. And so, just kind of moving the conversation in that way. And I have like a whole list of things <laughs> as an educator, but you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, scratching the surface, you know, really looking um, intently at your curriculum and really thinking like, what changes can I make to, um, you know, decolonize, that's the word, decolonize the curriculum, decolonize, you know, what we've been doing, so. I wanted to piggyback uh, to Chris to see if you wanted to add anything. I know you deal with uh, students and you're teaching acting, um, which uh, props. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do. And, and I teach Shakespeare. And I always say to my students, if this is going to be the pinnacle of your achievement, I have not done my job. Um, because Shakespeare wrote 400 years ago and did a great job of capturing humanity. And so if we can study how that worked there in that place in time, it will inform the way we tell stories about our place in time. And so I think um, one thing that I've always appreciated about East West Players is, is being in a community and understanding that this is, you know, a lot of people get to see themselves, right? Whether it's, I get to see myself in chess or i get to see myself in um you know sweeney todd um that's great like where else do performers get to do that and east west is a place where you can see stories like the great jerry curl debate that nobody else is necessarily putting on their stages and i think that that's where we're going it's like what are the stories we haven't seen right where what are the ones 
what are the stories that don't get told? And I think, you know, thinking about young audiences in the spring, I, I directed a play about physics for middle school students, um, about kids who love physics and love theme parks. I, I think that get in where you fit in is sort of, I think, where the storytelling is. Don't try and fit what somebody else did, right? Reflect your own experience or, or imagine how things might get better. I feel like we've had a lot of dystopia. I don't need to see another movie set in a dystopian future when I live in a dystopian present. That's not going to get me out of the dystopia. I need to see what might be better. What would that look like? How do we help people imagine that? And so I think the great Jerry Curl debate is a a wonderful first step. You know, it's like, if you haven't been thinking about it, here's something that might reframe the way you're thinking. Um, I think the more we give our students, our artists, our colleagues, our community members, our elders, how many stories do our elders know that they haven't told? It's so hard to be a young person and know what to ask. Right. So how do artists help young people talk to elders? Um, I think that there are, are so many opportunities and so many, so many storytellers who can tell us so much about ourselves, things that we thought we had to keep secret or things that we thought nobody would believe about us or things that we had to carry alone. So I think a lot about that. Like, what are the stories of the future so that you take your place in the line of storytellers that were way before Shakespeare? Shakespeare took his place in that line and now what comes next? I'm really excited for the what comes next. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. I wanted to close out by, um, having everybody talk about their organizations because we have such beautiful folks here who have amazing uh, organizations that you should check out and we'll link everybody's below. But Lee, I really would love for you to talk about your organization um, and just also what you feel um, new initiatives should be to continue conversations like this. Sure, um, I'll try to make it super quick though. <laughs> so, um, Honestly, I feel like, you know, um, I think about a lot about Grace Lee Boggs sometimes and something that she said is uh, building community is, the collect is to the collective as spiritual practice is to the individual. And when I think about interconnected struggle, I think a lot about how we need, in order to find that, we kind of have to corrode multiculturalist divisions of communities and between communities. And we can realize that through hybrid spaces, similar to the hybrid space located in the Great Jerry Curl debate, you know, where two communities come together and share a space. Um, so, as hybrid spaces, as like a site of shared and in, shared interconnected trouble, uh, struggle, Blasian March is kind of a part of that, absolutely, because it is uh, an organization, a grassroots org that focuses on mixed race individuals from uh, black and Asian communities, but also anybody who's mixed and at all related to that. And also it's, it isn't exclusively a mixed space, but it's one that champions mixed space as a way to corral multiculturalist divisions. Um, so Blasian March came together during the pandemic, so did Stop Discrimination, which is also kind of interesting when you think about mixed cultures. Um, Stop Discrimination is uh, comprised of East, uh, Southeast and South Asians uh, across the US. Um, and it's been pretty interesting to see how we've come together to understand the multiple levels of our community. Um, and then the last thing um, is Gyokpo, the uh, Korean American nonprofit that I, have been a community member of for a while. Um, we're working on a mixed race panel um, and that will hopefully turn into kind of a series that points to creating spaces that are hybrid and to acknowledge that we are all sharing space. We aren't necessarily divided by superficial ideas of how we're socially organized. Um, 
Thanks. Of course, I know I'm just, I'm so thrilled that you're here and to, to be able to share your work. Um, we also have another great organization um, in the form of Celia and Tiana. If you all want to talk more <laughs> about Blacklist and the standards uh, and all of your work, um, yeah, um, uh, Sally and I, along with our other co-founder, the incredible Ariel Flynn Bolden, um, we all, we're, we're uh, the founders of Blacklist, um, which is, it's spelled without any vowels um, and without a C. Um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's different than the, the, the film Blacklist that, that a lot of people know. Um, but yeah, but, but it came it came about as a the original inception of it was sort of a green book for LA theaters. And for those who don't know, it, um, it was sort of modeled after Victor Hugo Green's uh, The Negro Motorist Green Book, which helped which was designed to help mostly black people, but people of color like know where exactly in the country it was safe to travel um you know like it listed sundown towns it listed motels that accepted people of color it, it listed you know restaurants that were safe and that would serve non-white people and stuff um it, it was actually something that my grandmother used to uh when she drove cross country from washington dc to california it was something that she had to use in order to uh find safe spaces um and we wanted to use that to promote the concept of transparency and accountability um, in regards to the harm that happens so much to marginalized actors in, in you know, in LA theater. Um, uh, in a similar vein, the, the standards are modeled after the We See White American Theaters list of demands for Broadway. Um, and it came from a larger group that um, that wanted to sort of, I guess the idea was sort of like rebuilding a sort of Los Angeles theater center that wasn't designed wholly by artistic directors who mostly happen to be white and male and of a certain age. Um, and also just dismantling the cult, the, the institutions and the cultures that made it so white men of a certain age were the only ones eligible for authority. Um, but yeah, it, it, it really just started as a way in which to promote, or Blacklist started as a way in which to, to promote the idea of speaking about our harms and speaking about our experiences and shared experiences, um, which is something that's been brought up a lot in this conversation. Um, and dismantling the culture of silence and retaliation that upheld so many toxic and harmful and white supremacist, cult, uh, you know, interpersonal cultures, like in our re rehearsal spaces, in our offices, um, in our programming, in our seasons, and stuff like that. So, yeah, and I'll let I'll let Celia talk more about it. Um, but it's been it's been a journey. Thank you, Tiana. All of that was, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, yeah, we also focus on um, collecting certain data because um, these theater institutions are usually um, uh, nonprofits. So this is like public information. We feel like having a central hub of information um, will allow people to make decisions uh, on themselves, you know, like, should I go here based off of the information that is readily available, but is centrally located? Um, it's also our aim to create a, um, in terms of the, like, the, the green book, a, an even more direct way of, 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 of saying, based off of the information gathered, um, it looks like this theater is working towards progress or it looks like this theater is just like not participating in anti-racist things at all. Um, so that's a work in progress as well. Um, and then we've currently um, started a new initiative called preventative care where folks are re reaching out to us um, in our DMs, emailing us and basically being like, I'm in a situation, this is my experience. How can you support us? And one specific thing that that came out of that was like, if they're 
experiencing something or like see like super red flags, particularly with like a production, let's say, um, they'll reach out to us and we can reach out on behalf of the community to limit the um, retaliation that they would experience. So we're an entity and saying, hey, we're seeing this, you know, based off of your decisions for this piece or, you know, who you hired to do this and this is your history. And you signed on to LA Anti-Racist Theater Standards, you know, what we would like to see is this, 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 and that. And it's also a way of harm reduction because the people coming to us don't have to like step up to the plate and be like the sole person who works there or who works there often, hired as an actor or what have you. Um, and it prevents hopefully situations from occurring um, based off of them being willing to make adjust adjustments. Um, yeah, does that make sense? <laughs> this is all very new. So we're also trying to figure out how to like talk more about it because it's actually the first time we've like publicly shared that initiative. <laughs> yeah, of course, that makes a lot of sense. No, I'm, I'm really happy that um, you all shared. Thank you so much for that information. Um, I wanted to piggyback on Jade. I know you talked a little bit more about um, when Malcolm met Yuri, but is there anything else you wanted to add to that for, or if maybe there's other opportunities for folks to see or participate? Yeah, sure. So um, people can see the, the show uh, at actually East West Players in, in the courtyard. We like to do courtyard performances of our theater for youth show. Um, so the next couple will be on October 16th and 23rd at 4 30 p.m. And then we'll also be doing another one um, at Echo Park Library on October 17th as well, which is a Monday at 4 30 p.m. Um, also. So yeah, we also do professional enrichment programming. So we do have a couple of classes up still. Uh, and you can check that out at eastwestplayers.corestorm.org or is it corestorm.com? Corestorm.com actually. So eastwestplayers.corestorm.com. I was looking at Larry who's like right across from us. Like, is that right? <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Um, I wanted to also piggyback to Chris and see what what are you up to? Let us let us know what you're working on. Are you I know you're in yeah. rehearsals. If you're in Chicago, yeah, actually, as it turns out, I am working on an adaptation of Henry the Fourth Part One where the Shakespeare play is the play within the play and the students have created the metaverse of uh, what it is to be in drama school and what are the systems that they run up against in art school and what needs to change. So that so is a whole actually, conversation. That's <laughs> there incredible. Have been many conversations. Yeah. Many conversations. Wow. So we'll see how that goes. We open we tech we start tech tomorrow. We open in two weeks. So that's um I'm finding ways to bring my community based work to conservatory. All right. Well congratulations. All right, well, did anyone want to say any last final things or do any last final shout outs or anything? You want to make sure y'all got the time you need. Just right. Thank you. Gratitude. Thank you, Tyree. Thank you. Issa. Yeah, thank you, Tyree, for having me. All thank right. Thank you very much. Thank you. From thank you all for being here. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you all for joining us. Thank you, Tiana, Chris, Celia, Lee, Jade. Um, this has really been such an amazing conversation. And folks, we will have their uh, links where you can find everything that they've mentioned down below on YouTube. So please stay connected. Don't be strangers. And see the great Jerry Curl debate before it closes, because <laughs> it must close this weekend. Um, but yeah, be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us for such an amazing conversation that we had with Chris, Tiana, Celia, Lee, and Jade. Oh my God, the words that came out of their mouths were just true gems. And I can't wait to have more conversations like this at East West Players, even in person on stage or virtual still in this hybrid space that we're still in. But I also wanna remind you again that the great Jerry Curl debate has to close this weekend. So if you haven't, please get your tickets. We really want you to experience this show for yourself. So I hope you all are getting some rest and healing and uh, be well.